Hi, I'm Dr. Gil Welch, and this is the second of four brief presentations that attempt to communicate the trade-offs involved in cancer screening. This video will talk about false positive results. Let me start by reviewing exactly what cancer screening is. It's the systematic search for cancer in people who have no symptoms or signs of cancer. The primary benefit of cancer screening is a reduction of cancer-specific mortality. It doesn't always work, but if it does work, that's the primary benefit. And the language we should use is screening reduces the cancer death rate. There are two major harms of cancer screening. The first is false positive results, and the second is overdiagnosis. And overdiagnosis is a topic for the next video. Here we'll talk about false positive results. What is a false positive result? Well, it's a screening test that is worrisome for cancer, but ultimately no cancer is found. It's a false alarm. That's the common language used to describe it. Why? Because having a test result that's worrisome for cancer is understandably alarming to many people. Now, to understand where the word false positive comes from, you have to think about how we think about screening test performance. We think about a screening test result as falling into one of two categories, either abnormal or normal. An abnormal is considered a positive test result, and normal is considered a negative test result. And then we consider the actual disease status of the patient. Either the patient has cancer or doesn't have cancer. That leads to two columns and two rows, and we call this the two-by-two two table. Now what's up here? This is a person who has an, a cancer but, and has an abnormal or positive test result. That's a true positive test. How about down here? This is a patient that doesn't have cancer and has a normal or negative test result. That's a truly negative test result. I think of this as the good diagonal. The test is right diagonal. Now, how about down here? This is a person who has cancer, but has a normal or negative test result. That's a false negative test result. And it's tempting to blame this one on the test, but sometimes the problem's with the cancer. The cancer is growing very quickly and shows up soon after the test. How about up here? This is a person who doesn't have cancer, but nonetheless has an abnormal or positive test result. That's a false positive test result. And this is the bad diagonal. This is the test is wrong diagonal. Now you might wonder, which square are most people in? Well, in a screening situation, you're testing people with no signs or symptoms of the disease. And so most test, most test results will fall here. Most people will have truly negative test results. Why? Because most people don't have cancer. How many true positives? Well, they're pretty rare. This is less than 1%. Again, you're testing a population that doesn't have signs or symptoms of cancer. Most of them don't have cancer. Similarly, not many false positives, false negatives, I mean, it'll be less than 1%. But the false positives will be somewhere in between, roughly 5 to 10% of cancer screening tests will be falsely positive. They'll be false alarms. Now, cancer screening typically involves a repetitive process. We don't just screen people once. We screen people at regular intervals, such as annual screening. And false positive test results will accumulate over time. Let me give you some sense of that. And here I'll share with you the uh, results from the PLCO which examined PSA screening for prostate cancer. This is the U.S. trial of, of prostate cancer screening. In the initial screen, roughly 5% of men had a false positive test. On subsequent screens, that number went down. Roughly 3% had a false positive test. And that's sort of typical. Subsequent screens will have lower false positive test results. In a 10-year course of annual screening, however, those false positive test results will accumulate. 
and the estimated uh, data is that 25 to 30 percent of men will have at least one false positive test over a 10-year course of annual screening. Now I'll share with you CT screening, spiral CT screening, for lung cancer in heavy smokers. These are results from the NLST. On the initial screen, 27% had a false positive test. That simply reflects that there are a lot of lung nodules in heavy smokers. Subsequent screens, it went down to about 16% had a false positive test. But 70 to 90% would be estimated to have at least one false positive test over a 10-year course of annual screening. Now, for screening mammography, we don't have to estimate how often false positives happen over 10 years because the mammographers have kept very careful data on this in seven mammography registries across the country. And in a 10-year course of annual screening, the observed rate is somewhere between 30 to 75 percent of women will have at least one false positive test result over a 10-year course of annual screening. The 30 percent, the low end, represents women who are at low risk to have a false positive test result because their breasts are not dense and because they're seeing mammography, mammographers who have a high test threshold. They have a high threshold to call mammograms abnormal. The 75%, the other extreme, represent women at a high risk for false positive tests because they have dense breasts and their mammograms are being read by mammographers with a low threshold to call them abnormal. Anyway, you get the picture. False alarms are common in cancer screening. Now, as I said in the first video, cancer screening's up against staggering odds. This is a thousand squares, meant to represent screening a thousand individuals over a decade. Over the next 10 years, only a few, typically less than 1%, are actually destined to die from the cancer being screened for. That's why I say screening must involve many to potentially benefit a few. But all those gray squares can't be helped by screening. Only a fraction of them can. We're lucky if it's 25% to a third would be a very good screening test. They're helped in a big way. They help by avoiding a cancer death. But the rest are not helped. In fact, most are not helped. That's why it becomes relevant to ask the question, what happens to the other 997 or 998? Well, let's talk about the false alarm problem. This is 300 false alarms. And this would be the case for PSA screening for prostate cancer, or the low-end estimate for screening mammography. This is 700 false alarms. This would be the case for CT screening for lung cancer, or the high-end for screening mammography. Now, of course, having a false alarm and avoiding a cancer death are very different outcomes. Clearly, one's much more important than the other. It's relevant to ask the question, how much does the harm of false alarms really matter? To address this question, let me share with you some data from Denmark uh, on the long-term psychosocial consequences of false positive screening mammography. The investigators here did a three-year follow-up from the initial mammogram. And they examined three groups of women. Women who had breast cancer found, women who had false positive results, and women who had normal mammograms. They measured 12 psychosocial outcomes at five points in time across three years. Here are the five points in time. The zero time point is when the mammogram is immediately following the mammogram. Then a second measurement at one month, a third at six months, a fourth at 18 months, and a final one at 36 months or three years. Here the outcome is anxiety. And I'll put the normals up first. Not surprisingly, women with normal mammograms don't experience much anxiety. Here are the women with breast cancer. Not surprisingly, they have more anxiety. Where are the women with false positive results? Well, at time zero, they start here. And when I first saw that, I thought, oh, that's got to be wrong. Until I realized, at time zero, immediately following the mammogram, women don't know which group they're in. Are they going to be a falsely positive mammogram, or do they have breast cancer? 
One month later, anxiety levels drop in the false positive group as they're told that they don't have breast cancer. But even three years out, women with false positive test results have anxiety levels somewhere between women who have a normal mammogram and women who have breast cancer. As I said, they measured 12 psychosocial outcomes. Here are all the graphs for each. There are things like negative impact on sexuality, negative impact on behavior, negative impact on sleep, sense of dejection, need to take my mind off things, worries about breast cancer, loss of inner calm, and felt less attractive. And in each case, the picture is pretty much the same. Three years after a false positive mammogram, women's psychological health is somewhere in between women with a normal mammogram and those with breast cancer. Does this matter? Well, I think it's important for us in health to remember that health is more than a physical state of being. It's also a state of mind, and we have to be careful not to undermine that. Here's what you should know. First, roughly 5 to 10 percent of cancer screening tests produce false positive results. Second, because screening typically involves repeat testing, false positive results accumulate over time. Third, false positive results can have long-lasting psychological effects. Of course, it will vary from individual to individual. For some people, it may not be bothersome. For others, it may be considerably bothersome. And finally, alarming people unnecessarily is one harm of cancer screening, but it's not the only harm. We'll talk about overdiagnosis in the next video. Hope this helps.